All right, let's uh, grab our Bibles and we can get to the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 12. This week's uh, Torah portion is titled Tazria. Tazria means she conceives. Today we're going to be talking about more than skin deep. More than skin deep. And so we're going to just kind of, we're going to read all of chapter 12 because it's really short. And I just want to show you something with that. But our focus is going to be uh, in chapter 13. It says, And Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, When a woman has conceived and has given birth to a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her monthly separation, she is unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin is circumcised. And she remains in the blood of her cleansing 33 days. She does not touch whatever is set apart. And she does not come into the set apart place until the days of her cleansing are completed. But if she gives birth to a female child, then she shall be unclean for two weeks, as in her monthly separation. <clears throat> and she remains in the blood of her cleansing for 66 days. And when the days of her cleansing are completed, for a son or for a daughter, she brings to the priest a lamb a year old as an ascending offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering, to the door of the tent of appointment. And he shall bring it before Yehovah and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. This is the Torah for her who has given birth to a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as an ascending offering and the other as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Now, I want to remind you, in our studies in the book of Leviticus, the entire book is about the protocol to draw near, right? And so much of the protocol of the book of Leviticus is about maintaining holiness or maintaining holy space, right? Last week we talked about many of those things, including what the Father wants us to eat and not eat as an aspect of maintaining our holiness uh, towards Him. So I'm not going to explain a lot to you about why, why is the, the length of time longer for a, a, a female child than it is a male child or any of those kind of things. I just want to show you um, one thing, and you can go to the book of Luke, chapter 2, and I want you to see this. In the life of our master, Yeshua, he had good parents. And his parents did things according to the word of Elohim. In Luke, chapter 2, starting in verse 21, it says this, And when eight days were completed for him to be circumcised, his name was called Yeshua. In, in, traditionally in Judaism, they don't name their child until the eighth day. And so on the day that a male child was circumcised, then he would be called by his name. And it says the name given by the messenger before he was conceived in the womb. And then it says, and when the days of her cleansing, according to the Torah of Moshe, were completed... They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to Yehovah. As it has been written in the Torah of Yehovah, every male who opens the womb shall be called set apart to Yehovah. And to give an offering according to what is said in the Torah of Yehovah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This tells us a lot of information. And so there's two things I want to point out to you. I said it already. Yeshua had good parents that followed the word. So they followed the Torah to the letter about what to do. They didn't miss one note of what their responsibilities were to him. And the interesting part is they qualified for the offering of the poor. Right? If you were able or you were rich or you had enough of a flock, you would bring a, a lamb and a turtle dove, or a pigeon. If you could not afford to bring the lamb, you would bring two pigeons or two turtle doves. And in the case of 
case of Miriam or Mary, they were not affluent. Joseph had a good job and he had enough to provide for his family, but they were not rich by any means, and so they qualified for the offering of the two pigeons. So whether middle class or lower class or however you want to see it, like we, gotta, we can't keep projecting Americanized thought on the Bible. Um, there really wasn't a middle class. There was the very, very rich, and there were the poor. And there was no one in between. Um, and so Yeshua grew up in a poor home. Just uh, an interesting piece. All right, so let's get back to uh, Leviticus. And we're really going to get into our <clears throat> topic for today. How many of you read this section? So I know what I can breeze or not breeze. Leviticus chapter 13 deals with what is commonly translated as leprosy. But when you study out leprosy, what you find out is what they are referring to is not what is actually leprosy. Okay, Though it's been historically translated... Um, it's not actually what medically would be considered uh, leprosy. So the word here is tzarat. Uh, and it present, presents its, itself in people as a malignant skin disease, but in garments or buildings as a mildew or mold. Right. So leprosy in the medical field is not something that is capable of being in garments or buildings. It's specific to the, to the human skin. This is something different. And it presents itself as a malignant skin disease in people. And in garments or buildings, it would look like a mold or a mildew. But that's just what we see on the surface. Something I thought was quite interesting is how this word is spelled. It has the Hebrew letters tzadi, Resh, Ayin, Tav. And I'll remind you what they mean. The letter Tzadi stands for righteous or justice. Resh is the head, and the Ayin is the eye, and Tav is the letter that represents covenant. So something I want you to consider with Zerat is that Zerat is actually justice from the head through the eyes of the covenant. In other words, scripturally we understand that Sarat was something that the father inflicted someone with because they violated part of his law. So in other words, it's justice from the head or the great king of heaven through the eyes of the covenant. He's looking through the lens of the covenant and the agreement that was made between him and man and saying, you have violated this specific part, this is the repercussions of that. Uh, if you don't believe me, we will get there and we will look at multiple cases of this. Uh, I'm going to read uh, quite a few pieces to you from... Uh, this is the Chumash, okay? It has the Torah portions and things in it and some commentary concerning it. Some of it's uh, of significant value, and it's like everything, you have to spit out the bones. So I'm going to read a section of this for you. I want to make sure I'm starting in the right place. Okay. The Laws of Tzarat. For hundreds of years, the popular transla translation of Tzarat has been leprosy. And it was commonly accepted that prevention of the disease's spread was the reason for the quarantine of a suspected victim of Tzirat, and the exclusion from the camp of a confirmed Metzora, or a person with Tzirat. R. Hirsch demonstrates at length and conclusively that both of these notions are completely erroneous. Very briefly, he shows that the symptoms of Tzirat, as outlined in the Midrash, are far different from those of leprosy. Furthermore, it, if the reason for the Metzorah's confinement is to prevent contagion, then some of the laws <clears throat> would be ludicrous. For example, if the malady covers the victim's entire body, he is not considered unclean. 
But if his skin begins to heal, and beco- he becomes unclean. In the case of a house that is afflicted, the Torah prescribes that before the house is pronounced unclean, all its contents should be removed because they would become contaminated, contaminated if they were left inside at the time of the pronouncement. This is all interesting, right? But if there were a danger of contagion, it would be irrational for the afflicted household items to be excluded from the quarantine. If perhaps, uh, in perhaps the most telling example, the Talmud teaches that if the symptoms of Tzirat appear on a newlywed or during a festival season, the Kohen does not examine the affliction or declare it to be unclean in order not to interfere with the celebration. But if the purpose of these laws is to prevent the spread of disease, it would be absolutely imperative to enforce the laws at times of great overcrowding and mingling. Clearly, as the sages teach, Tzarat is not a bodily disease, but the physical manifestation of a spiritual malaise, a punishment designed to show the malefactor that he must mend his ways. The primary cause of Tzurat is the sin of slander, the sages. As the sages say, the word, <clears throat> oh, I don't know that word. The word for slander is a contraction of the phrase, one who spreads slander. Oh, Matsara. Oh, the word Matsara. So one who contracts leprosy. The word Matsara is a contraction of the phrase, one who spreads slander. Similarly, the sages teach that the affliction is a punishment for the sins of bloodshed, false oaths, sexual immorality, pride, robbery, and selfishness. The pattern that emerges is that it is a divine retribution for the offender's failure to feel the needs and share the hurt of others. God rebukes this antisocial behavior by isolating him from society so that he can experience the pain he has imposed on others and heal himself through repentance. So you can hear in, in that how it's this physical manifestation that's a um, manifestation of something that's much deeper more than skin deep. The Talmud lists seven causes of tzirat, murder, adultery, pride, theft, stinginess, a vain oath, and what is called lashan hara. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Lashan hara, or slander, is literally translated uh, the evil tongue. And I want to read uh, something concerning that to you. You bear with me. I think these pieces are important to give us a little more insight uh, in how this was viewed. <clears throat> uh, in general terms, Lashon Hara means the evil tongue. But it should not be understood as exclusively as saying slanderous things about others or using profanity, though that is certainly included in the concept. No, Lashon Hara means saying something bad about another person, even if it happens to be true. In other words, Lashon Hara is gossip, spreading evil if true reports, or expressing a critical spirit about others. Such behavior is explicitly forbidden in Leviticus 19, verse 16. Of course, there are times when a person is obligated to speak out, even though the information is disparaging. For example, while testifying under oath, speaking righteous judgment, uh, and so on. Indeed, sometimes it is the mark of a coward to refrain from speaking the truth when it is needed. However, the practice of being motzira, or someone who speaks evil, is related to the statutes of Metzora, the one who is, who is afflicted with tzorat. 
And therefore, many of the Jewish sages have made the connection between the sin of Lashon Hara and the unclean condition known as Tzarat. <clears throat> so, what we need to understand here is that this is something much more than a contagious skin disease. This is indicated by three, three things. The first one I think is the most interesting, maybe, is that the individual or the building or the piece of garment isn't inspected by a doctor. It's at the pronouncement of a priest, of a holy man, of a Kohen, or someone in that position was the one and the only one who could tell that they had sarat. You may look at a person, I may look at a person, and I may see uh, a, a, what looks like some form of skin disease, and we may go, oh, they're a leper, or they're at tzara, they have tzarat, they're a metzora. But only a priest was allowed to actually pronounce that. So that says to me that it's more spiritual uh, than physical. Leviticus 13 tells us that it's, it's sarat is something that appears deeper than the skin. In Leviticus 13, seven times it says that sarat appears deeper than the skin. In verse 3, verse 4, verse 25, verse 30, 31, 32, and 34. So seven times in talking about what we, we've commonly known as this leprosy thing, it says it appears deeper than the skin. To me, that's more than just literal. It's metaphorical of the spiritual. And then something that is really interesting, in Leviticus 13, well, we could read this, go to verse 12, it says, And if leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy shall cover all the skin of the infected one, from his head to his foot, wherever the priest looks, then the priest shall look and see if the leprosy has covered all his body, he shall pronounce the infected one clean. And has turned, it has all turned white, he is clean. Isn't that interesting? I don't know about you. To me, that's very interesting. So what, what can we extrapolate from this? If it completely covered the body and turned white, they were considered clean. But then it goes on to say that from that position, if a piece of raw skin or some other indicator of, of tzarat showed up, they would be unclean again. It could be symbolic of, of the fact that the punishment of the father was in its full measure and complete. But the place this reminded me of in the scriptures is Psalm 51. So let's go to Psalm 51, and I want you to hear the reading of this in light of what we're talking about. Uh, if you read next week's Torah portion as well, Psalm 51 really starts to illuminate. But if they were completely covered in the body and it turned white, they were considered clean. Psalm 51, David writes this psalm after the sin he committed with Bathsheba, after the sin he committed against Uriah uh, the Hittite, after uh, the child that Bathsheba had died. David writes this psalm. He says, Show me favor, O Elohim, according to your loving commitment. According to the greatness of your compassion, he says, blot out my transgressions. Wash me completely from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you alone have I sinned and done evil in your eyes. That you might be proven right in your words. Be clear when you judge. See, I was brought forth in crookedness and in sin my mother conceived me. The verse 5 is interesting to me because that, to me it seems to connect to uh, Leviticus chapter 12. Um, verse 6 says, See, you have desired truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. Clean me with hyssop, and I am clean. 
Wash me, and what? I am whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my crookedness. Now we see this transform this this change in language. He says, "Create in me a clean heart." If you go on to read in the book of Leviticus about how a Metzora, one who had leprosy, was pronounced clean in the cleansing process. They would use hyssop dipped in clean water, and they would sprinkle it over them, and they would be pronounced clean. So David's literally recounting the, the Torah protocol for the cleansing of a leper. But what David recognizes is he doesn't have this malady in the skin, and though no one else could see it, David in his heart knew that something was wrong internally in him. And so he says, create in me, in verse 10, a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your set-apart spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance and uphold me, noble spirit. Let me teach transgressors your ways so that sinners turn back to you. Deliver me from blood, guilt, O Elohim, Elohim of my deliverance. Let my tongue sing aloud of your righteousness. O Yehovah, open my lips and that my mouth declare your praise. For you do not desire slaughtering or I would give it. You do not delight in ascending offering. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. O Elohim, these you do not despise. Now listen as he goes on, because if we stopped there, we would presume that the Father has no joy in the sacrifices. But look what it says. It says, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you would delight in slaughterings of righteousness, in ascending offering, in complete ascending offering. Then your bulls would be offered on your slaughter place. Slaughterings of righteousness. In other words, it's from a different position and a different perspective. Wash me whiter than snow. That reminded me of the complete whiteness when you were completely covered with tzarat and pronounced clean. The question is, what, what sins did David commit that he came to the Father in this place and he's burdened by this, this, his transgressions? There were two. What was the sin he committed with Bathsheba? Adultery. What was the sin he committed against Uriah the Hittite? Murder. So two of the seven sins that are considered uh, in, by the sages of old as the reasons for contracting tzarat are, two of the sins, are the two sins that David committed. What's interesting is if you were considered unclean, you couldn't bring an offering. If you were considered unclean from Tzarat, you were unable to bring an offering to the Father until that Tzarat was gone. Until the priest deemed you clean from Tzarat, you could not even bring an offering. So that seems to me to be interesting here when he says you don't desire slaughterings, or I would give it. But what you want is a heart broken and crushed. In other words, a heart that is soft and tender towards him and tender, tender towards his ways. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. O Elohim, these you do not despise. That's, that's the heart of repentance. And because of the heart of repentance in verse 17, then verse 19 applies. Then you would delight in slaughterings of righteousness. But the Father doesn't care about anything we offer to Him if we're doing it in an ugly heart. If we're doing it with hidden sins within us, that maybe, maybe we were fortunate and we haven't been um, inflicted with a malady of the skin on the outside, but nevertheless, there's something in the heart Something deeper than the skin. What this is really saying is unless you are repentant, your sacrifice is unrighteous 
and therefore unacceptable. Let's go back to uh, Leviticus 13. Speaking of the person who had uh, tzarat and was completely covered in it and turned white, verse 14 says, But the day raw flesh appears on him, he is unclean. In other words, if you freshen up that sin, you are unclean. And just because you were declared clean from it once doesn't mean you are permanently clean. Right? In, in our nation, we have the double jeopardy law, right? You know about du double jeopardy, right? You've heard about that law where you can't be tried for the same thing twice? The same exact thing. But not so in, 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 in God's word. Just because you were declared clean from it once doesn't mean you are permanently clean. That's something we have to stress and understand because that has implications after coming to the Father through Yeshua. We need to be careful in how we're living our life. We don't get to just be any old way and any old person. We don't get to have all this ugliness inside us and think we're, we're okay in the presence of God, that He's all right with us. All of this points to tzarat being an internal condition with an external manifestation. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4 as we look at some instances of this. Midrash says that Moses was the first uh, person to have tzarat. And that's because it is the first mention in the scriptures of it in Exodus chapter 4, <clears throat> picking up in verse 1, it says, And Moshe answered and said, And if they do not believe me, nor listen to my voice, and say, Yehovah has not appeared to you. And Yehovah said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moshe fled from it. And Yehovah said to Moshe, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and took hold of it, and it became a rod in his hand. So that they believed that Yehovah Elohim of their fathers, the Elohim of Avraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov has appeared to you. And Yehovah said to him again, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, see, his hand was tzarat. It was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And see, it was restored like his other flesh. So in, in the Midrash, in, in traditional Judaism, they say Moses was the first one who was given tzarat because Moses spoke uh, poorly against the Israelites, saying they would not believe me even if I came to them. The next instance we have is very, very clear. Go to the book of Numbers, chapter 12. In Numbers, chapter 12, it begins by saying, Now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moshe because of the Cushite woman whom he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite woman. And they said, Has Yehovah spoken only through Moshe? Has he not also spoken through us? And Yehovah heard it. And the man Moshe was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly Yehovah said to Moshe and Aaron and Miriam, You three come out to the tent of appointment. So the three came out. And Yehovah came down in the column of cloud and stood in the door of the tent. And called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. And he said, Hear now my words. If your prophet is of Yehovah, I make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moshe. He is trustworthy in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth, and plainly, and not in riddles. And he sees the form of Yehovah, so why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? 
and the displeasure of Jehovah burned against them, and he left. And the cloud turned away from above the tent, and look, Miriam was tzarat. She was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and look, a leper. So we, we even have Aaron declaring Miriam here in this moment as a leper. And Aaron said to Moshe, now listen to these words, Oh, my master, please do not hold against us the sin in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead when coming out of his mother's womb with his flesh half consumed. <clears throat> and Moshe cried out to Yehovah, saying, O oh, El, please heal her, please. Imagine if we were a little like Moshe, that even when they were speaking against us, we could still pray on their behalf. And Yehovah said to Moshe, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that, let her be readmitted. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not set out until Miriam was readmitted. And afterward, the people departed from Hetzerot, and they camped in the wilderness of Paran. There's a lot in here. First of all, Aaron and Miriam both speak evil of Moses. And Elohim backed Moses up. It reminds me of Psalm 105.15 saying, Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. The preceding verse to that, Psalm 105 verse 14, says that Elohim reproves sovereigns. In other words, it's his responsibility to deal with the anointed ones. We see this played out in a beautiful way in the life of David. David, through his whole life, once he was anointed, and we can kind of see this in, you know, Aaron and Moses are both the anointed ones of God at this point when we're in, in this place in the book of Numbers. So David, when he's dealing with Saul after David knew he was going to be king, never speaks a reviling word, never brings his hand against Saul even though he had multiple opportunities to do so. He kept his mouth shut. Yeshua, the same way. He's the ultimate pinnacle of the anointed one, right? And yet, Scripture says he went silent. Paul, when he's being accused gets himself in a little bit of trouble because he says something to a man who's standing in front of him when he's being questioned by the council. He gets slapped in the mouth. And Paul's response is, forgive me, I didn't know he was the high priest. In other words, I know what Scripture says. I'm not about to do what Miriam did. I'm not going to touch them because that's the father's problem. Miriam contracts leprosy. Aaron doesn't. But if you read it, and Mr. Gray said it, Aaron, in verse 11, repents. And maybe it took Aaron seeing Miriam as a leper to do it, but Aaron repented. I don't read in this text that Miriam repented, but she would have had to repent in order for the leprosy to go away. Miriam was put out of the camp for seven days. We'll talk more about being put out of the camp later, but for seven days, that's, that's a completion, right? The cycle of sevens that, that, that always speaks to us when we see that in Scripture as the completion of something. So in other words, the time of her punishment was fulfilled. That brought her to repentance. It says to me this, just because what you see doesn't look right in your eyes, 
doesn't give you the right to speak against the people of Elohim. Miriam and Aaron are looking at Moses' situation and the fact that he took this woman from Cush as a wife. And they use that as an opportunity to degrade and speak against Moses and his position. We need to be careful. If church so-and-so in the city of Kingston or church such-and-such in Newburgh or, or in Albany or in Texas or in Bangladesh or wherever it is, if they're not doing right, it's not our responsibility to speak evil of them. We need to be careful because the sin of Lashon Ra is just that. It's speaking bad of someone else. It's one thing if we're called into a court of law and we have to, we have to speak righteously. If you're held under oath, you have to speak the truth. But sometimes I think we like to get gain out of being able to speak negatively of the other. I think sometimes we, we validate our own position by how we can negatively speak about someone else. My position in standing in this pulpit and delivering the Word of God is not hinged on whether the pastor across the water is doing a good or a poor job. Nor does my position get elevated because I, can, I see something that I don't agree with and I speak negatively of that. If you noticed in my life, I don't speak in specifics concerning Christianity and things that are going on. I speak in generalities because we all need to do better. There's a difference between privately rebuking someone and publicly slandering them. If you see someone doing wrong, there's scripture to tell us what to do. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. You know, Mike Tyson... I can't believe I'm using Mike Tyson in sermon, but Mike Tyson's on record as saying that one of the problems with social media is that it made people bigger than they are and that it gave them license to say a lot of things that they should just get punched in the mouth for. And it's true. And social media has done the same in the body, too. We casually slander other believers because we're not seeing them face to face and, we, and there's seemingly no punishment coming for it. We need to be careful. Matthew 18, picking up in verse 15, it says, And if your brother sins against you, go and convict him between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. And if he refuses to hear them, say it to the assembly. And if he refuses even to hear the, the assembly, let him be to you like the nations and a tax collector." That phrase, like, like the nations and the tax collector, that is, um, that's metaphorical for let him be like someone who is unclean to you. You could even say like a leper. Let him be someone that you avoid, that you, that you separate from, that you no longer allow in, allow in the camp. But do you see the protocol here? It's privately then it's privately again with one or two more brothers. In other words, if I have a problem, let's say I have a problem with Mr. Gray. He did something wrong inside the community in my eyes. I better go to him 
privately. And if he doesn't hear me, then I'm to bring at least one, if not two more brothers. Now, I'm not going down the street to get some random brother. I'm going to bring somebody that has influence, that has a voice in his life that he may be able to hear. Not just someone who's going to stand behind me and back me up in some kind of strange way, right? I'm not going to go hire a couple hitmen. If he doesn't hear then, then I have the responsibility to stand here and bring it to the assembly. And then if he still doesn't hear, then he's to be like the nations and a tax collector. We kick him out. You're not getting kicked out. I like picking on him because he doesn't give me a hard time unless I deserve a hard time. This is similar to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. How we doing? First Corinthians six and starting in verse five, it says, "I say this to your shame: Is it so that er, that there is not a wise one among you, not even one who shall be able to judge between his brothers? But brother against brother goes to be judged." And that before unbelievers. I will never understand that. I will never understand why two parties inside the congregation of God would ever go outside that body to sort out a dispute. Instead of going to people who are supposed to uphold this document, you're going now to people who have removed this document. And no longer do you have to say, you put your hand on this thing. Whether you're lying or telling the truth, you no longer are held under oath according to this in the judicial system. So why would you go there before an unrighteous judge? This is what he says, already then there is a failure with you, that you have lawsuits among you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? But you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and that to your brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the reign of Elohim? Did, did you ever consider, this is just a, a, an ongoing text, listen to this. Do not be deceived, neither those who whore, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy of gain, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the reign of Elohim. And such were some of you. But you were washed... You were set apart, but you were declared right in the name of the Master Yeshua and by the Spirit of our Elohim. Most of this list is what's considered the sins that caused leprosy. Did you notice that? Yeah. That puts you out of the camp. One of the best ways to settle a dispute is to keep your mouth shut. I'm working on that one. But one of the best ways to settle a dispute is to keep your mouth shut. Moses didn't say anything. When Miriam and Aaron, Aaron's the high priest now. Aaron's overseeing all the priesthood and all the sacrifice and all of this. He's a man of prowess and he's a man of power and he's a man of the anointing and appointed by God. And when he brought an accusation against Moses, Moses did not speak a word. And the father spoke up. In fact, Moses goes even further than that. He doesn't even speak a word against them. When Aaron says to Moses, please ask the Father to forgive us, Aaron could have done that himself. But he asks Moses in a submission type uh, aspect to prove that he was repentant. Aaron didn't necessarily have to submit to Moses, but he does it to prove his repentant heart, and Moses prays for them. And the father still deemed his judgment. No leprosy for Aaron, Miriam out of the camp.
do not slander believers, neither in the congregation nor in the world. All that does is give our master a bad rap. If I go in the world and I start dogging another Christian, all that does is make it harder for people to come through Yeshua to the Father. It's not hurting that person. It's hurting the kingdom. The next instance we have is the king, Uzziah. Or Uzziah. We need to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Picking up in verse 16. See, Uzziah was 16 years old when, when he became the king. And he did a lot of good things. But verse 16 says, But when he became strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he trespassed against Yehovah his Elohim by entering the Hekal of Yehovah to burn incense on the slaughter place of incense. And as a Yahu, the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of Yehovah who were brave men. Thank God for brave men. And they stood up against sovereign Uzziahu and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziahu, to burn incense to Yehovah, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who are set apart to burn incense. Get out of the set-apart place, for you have trespassed, and there is no esteem to you from Yehovah Elohim. And Uzziahu was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of Yehovah, beside the incense slaughter place. And Azayahu, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him and saw that he was leprous on his forehead, and they hurried him from there, and he also hurried to get out, because Yehovah had struck him. Look at verse 21. And sovereign Uzziahu was a leper until the day of his death, and dwelt in a separate house because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of Yehovah. And Yotham his son was over the sovereign's house, ruling the people of the land. Uzziah who tried to do what was only permitted by the priest. Uzziah whose name means my strength is Yehovah. I think that's interesting in this context because when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. In other words, pride. Right? One of those seven sins that's listed as, as a potential cause for tzarat. Where did the leprosy break out on Uzziahu? On his forehead. Listen to this. According to Leviticus 13, the only place you don't have to see if the sore appears deeper than the skin, is the head or forehead. If you read Leviticus 13, anywhere else on the body, the priest had to look to see if it was deeper in the skin. But if it was on the forehead or the top of the head of a bald man, he didn't have to do an inspection. He knew it was tzarat. And you could tell from a distance. In other words... The offender is not trying to hide the internal issue at all, as was the case with Utsiyahu. And maybe pride is the worst one of all of these, because I think pride is probably the one that leads to all of these. Pride in us is what uh, causes us to feel like we have the right to slander another. Pride in us causes us to feel like we have the right to commit certain sins. When we look at the, the issues of adultery in Scripture, it was pride. David had pride and thought he's the king, he can have what he wants, so he takes Bathsheba. 
And he finds out that really wasn't the best move, and so he has to begin covering it up. And he tries to bury it with the sin of murder. David, by rights, probably should have been a leper. And the father was merciful to him. But for Uziahu, it was not the same. Because he was so blatantly prideful about what he did, he was a leper till he died and lived in a separate house. I want to read another uh, piece of this to you out out of the Chumash. This is concerning Leviticus 13, verse 44. In all previous cases, the Torah uses the pronoun only. Here the Torah speaks of the person. Verse 44 says, uh, He is a person with sarat. He is contaminated. The Kohen shall declare him contaminated. His affliction is upon his head. So talking about baldness or one on the head or on the forehead. Here the Torah speaks of the person. When the merciful God punishes a person, he prefers to do so in a way that will not cause him public humiliation. Let the sinner know and repent, but let him not be humiliated unnecessarily. This is indicated by the Torah's uh, reference to him rather than to the person with tzarat. The tzarat of baldness is different. Its location is such that everyone sees the affliction and knows that God has withheld his mercy from the sinner. Apparently, he has sinned in a grievous manner, as is implied by the Torah's description of him as a person with tzarat. All right, we need to go to Leviticus 13 and verse 45. As for the leper who has the infection, his garments are torn and his head is uncovered. And he has to cover his upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. He is unclean all the days he has the infection. He is unclean. He is unclean and he dwells alone. His dwelling place is outside the camp. If someone was considered to have tzarat, they were expelled in the time of the wilderness. Uh, They were expelled from three camps. The first one is the camp of the tabernacle, the mishkan. They would be expelled from the camp of the Levites or the priests, and ultimately or completely they would be expelled from the camp of the Israelites. In the time of the temple, they would be kicked out of the walled cities, and they would have to live outside the walls. They would live outside of the protection of the nation. They would live outside of the sanctity of the priesthood. They would live outside of the set-apartness of the holy place. Surat was one of the sins, one of the only sins, that was complete banishment outside of um, the community. Other sins, you couldn't come in contact with with foods that were deemed holy or the priesthood. And then other sins, you couldn't even come into proximity of the holy place. But Sarat was different. Sarat was banishment from the entire community. It should help us understand how grievous of a thing the Father deemed this. I thought of this in light of that. In temple times, they had to move outside the walled cities. Sins leading to Tzarat will keep you from the new Jerusalem. But if in this process of Tzarat and being expelled out of the camp, they performed Teshuvah, or they repented, then Yehovah would heal them and they could return. If they repented, he would heal them. And so it, the Hebrew sages would say, as I read before, he, he heals himself. You heal yourself by repenting and placing yourself before the one who can heal you. 
thus him actually healing you. I thought in light of being kicked out of the camp, it was interesting to me that according to Hebrews 13, 12, Yeshua suffered and died outside the city to set the people apart by his blood. Now, let's go there for a moment because we want to read a little further. Yeshua dies outside the camp, not because he's a leper. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13, but you, you have to understand, so think of it this way. Um, capital punishment would not have been done inside the confines of the city of Jerusalem, nor would, have, would it have been permitted close to or even on Temple Mount to maintain the holiness of those spaces. Because if someone died, right, it would have to go through ritual cleansing for that, but Yeshua dies outside the camp. Picking up in verse 12, and so Yeshua also suffered outside the gate to set apart the people with his own blood. Let us then, so in light of that, in light of Yeshua setting apart a people with his own blood, let us then go to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For we have no lasting city here. But we seek the one coming. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a slaughtering of praise to Elohim that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And do not forget to do good and to share, for with such slaughterings Elohim is well pleased. Obey those leading you, and be subject to them. For they watch for your lives as having to give account. Let them do so with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You hear all that language? In light of what Yeshua did, in light of him setting apart a, a, a people by his blood, don't be concerned about making it to Jerusalem now. Look for the Jerusalem that's to come. That's the preface, right? And offer up Praise to Elohim. So everything from here seems to be connected to the mouth. First of all, in this cleaned up position, offer praise to, to God and speak well of Him. Right? Be careful of the language we use towards our Creator. And do not forget to do good and to share and obey those leading you and be subject to them. It says, let them do so with joy and not groaning. So we're supposed to do all these things, offer praise to God, subject ourselves to those who are in authority over us, and do good to each other with joy and without complaining. All of that seems to me to fit the context of if we do the opposite, tzarat is the option. You want tzarat or you want cleanness? Tahor. <clears throat> Interesting, right? He did it outside the camp to bring many who were outside in. Be obedient, be in subjection, and watch your tongue. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. I'll give you an example of, of how powerful our words can be. I was pretty upset recently in my home and having a heated discussion with my wife. That's... Metaphorical for a fight and an argument, for those of you who don't know that. And something came out of my mouth that has never come out of my mouth in my house. And the moment it did, I could feel it in the house. And it made me silent. The moment I said it, I'm not going to tell you what I said. And quite frankly, I don't even know if I remember exactly what I said. I could feel it. 
and I could feel it shift the house. My wife felt it, and I'm sure my children felt it. It was a reminder to me of how careful we need to be. And even in those moments, even in those moments when our emotions want to cause us to say things that we shouldn't, we need to be really careful. I had until that moment been very calculated and very careful, even in arguing. Even in times when my wife and I had disputes, I was very careful. And I was just in a bad spot and was foolish. And I tell you all of that to, to remind you that we need to be aware, we need to be alert, and we need to be careful. You can't take a single word back. You can repent, you can ask to be forgiven, but you cannot pull that word back in your mouth. And there's been too many times in the life of this guy that I've been way too mouthy. Hopefully, I'm starting to learn. Yeshua, in Matthew chapter 8, it says this, And when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And see, a leper came and bowed before him, saying, Master, if you desire, you are able to make me clean. And stretching out his hand, Yeshua touched him and saying, I desire it, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Yeshua said to him, see, mention it to no one. In other words, hold your tongue. Isn't that interesting? Just tell him to be silent, because probably his mouth is what got him in the situation in the first place. But go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the, offer the gift that Moshe commanded as a witness to them. There's something really interesting here that happens, and we're going to look at another instance when Yeshua heals, heals ten lepers. But Torah was still the protocol. Though Yeshua, the Father, miraculously uses Yeshua to re remove the tzarat from this man, who, by the way, only could have had that removed if he was repentant, and his posture of bowing in humility was the indicator of repentance. Though Yeshua was able to hear, heal him, Yeshua was not allowed to pronounce him clean. He had to go to a priest to be pronounced clean. It's all Torah protocol. Go to uh, the book of Luke, chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 and starting in verse 11 says this, And it came to be as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Shomeron and Galil. And as he was entering into a certain village, he was met by ten leprous men who stood at a distance. So he's out, as he's entering into the village, he's outside the village still. These ten men from a distance recognize Yeshua and they cry out to him. They lifted up their voices saying, Yeshua, Master, have compassion on us. And having seen them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And it came to be that as they were going, they were cleansed. So he's, it's, this is still Torah protocol, right? You would have to go show yourself to the priest. If you thought you were clean, you went to the priest, and the priest could say you're clean. If he said you're not clean, back out of the camp. And it came to be that as they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, praising Elohim with a loud voice, and he fell down upon his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Shomeroni. Here's what's interesting. That word Shomeroni is the Greek word allogenes, which means of another race. Allogenes. In other words, he had different genes, per se. It wasn't a Jew. 
He wasn't even one who necessarily had covenant, but he was one who recognized. And look what it says. And Yeshua answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to Elohim except this one, this foreigner, this one of another race? And he said to him, Rise, go your way. Your belief has made you well. His belief in what? In the word, right? That he believed the word of Elohim so much that he recognized who Yeshua was, he humbled himself and was healed. But he was told to follow the protocol of the word, to go and show yourself to the priest. Yeshua healed them, and I, t I told you it's only possible if they repented. And this was seen in them turning and bowing and crying out for mercy at a distance. He required them to do what the Torah said. Your belief or your belief expressed in obedience is what has brought this healing. Only Elohim, only Elohim can change a man from the inside out. We can never forget that. Only Elohim can change a man from the inside out. We can do a real good job, a doctor in the outside up and making it look real pretty and inside be a tomb. But only Elohim can change a man from the inside out. He may use the chastisement of Tzarat to do so, but nevertheless, only he can. The father would, would inflict someone with Tzarat because they committed a certain category of sin with the hope that they would repent. It wasn't just to to be mean. It wasn't just to be an angry God. It wasn't just to, to inflict punishment, but it was a punishment with the hope of repentance, as all of it is when he punishes his children. Let's look at two more pieces of Scripture that we've been looking at a lot. Go to the book of Jeremiah 31. These are good, constant reminders to us. Jeremiah 31, picking up in verse 31. It says, See, the days are coming, declares Jehovah, when I shall make a renewed covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I strengthened their hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares Jehovah. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares Jehovah, I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Maybe, just maybe, if we could call to our remembrance Miriam, Aaron, Uzziah, Moshe, in our moments of wanting to speak slanderous words about the men and women of Elohim, maybe it would cause us to hold our tongue. Maybe if the word of Elohim was written on our heart, it would act as reins upon the mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Turn with me to Ezekiel 36. In similar language to the cleansing of the leper, in verse 25 it says, And I shall sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I cleanse you and here's the kicker because after all it is more than skin deep 
and I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you, and I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I shall be your Elohim. To me, it almost seems to be restored from tzerat, clean water, new heart, obedience, dwelling in the land or back in the camp. Here's the bottom line. We need to allow our high priest, Yeshua, from the place he is, to check us by the Holy Spirit, to see what is more than skin deep, to pluck it out, to clean us up, and keep us in the camp. If we are quick to speak ill of another, it's an indicator of something more than skin deep. If pride begins to arise, it's an indicator of something that is more than skin deep. And I think ultimately we should be like David and pray that he would create in us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in us. It is sometimes so easy to be cutting with your words. And yet there is great grace in maintaining silence when all you want to do is lash out. Father, I ask that your grace would be upon us to keep our mouths shut. May we learn to use your word, O King, to bridle our tongues. For who can bridle the tongue? As James said, it is a little fire that could kindle a forest. We ask, O King, that by your word and through your spirit, you would enable us to bridle the tongue that we would speak ill of no one. And that those you have appointed, those you have anointed, we would leave in your hands. Do with them as you will. Chastise them if need be. Bless them if it fits, Father. Do what you will, that they would walk in your camp uprightly. If tzarat is the portion, Father, use it for its purpose to bring repentance and restoration into the camp. We continue to trust you in all things. May we prove it by living out your word and speaking well of all, especially of our brothers and our sisters. In Yeshua's name, amen.